So good evening, everybody. I'm Anthony Maricola, Manager of Adult Services at New Canaan Library. I'm very delighted to welcome you this e for, to this evening's program. Our speaker this evening, Gil Harrell, he should be no stranger to the New Canaan community. Gil is a musicologist and a music theorist whose interests include styles ranging from Western classical repertoire to jazz. Previously, he has served on the faculty at CUNY Baruch College, where he was awarded the prestigious Presidential Excellence Award for Distinguished Teaching as well as Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in Chengdu, China. Currently, he teaches at Nagatuck Valley Community College, where he was presented with the Merit Award for exemplary service to the college. At NVCC, Dr. Harrell, Harrell conducts the College Choral, a cappella ensemble, teaches music history and theory, and serves as musical director of theater productions. Outside of teaching, he enjoys staying active as a pianist and vocalist. Tonight, he will discuss Act One of Hamilton in this two-part series titled Inside the Score of Hamilton. Please be sure to register for part two, which will be held Thursday, April 8th at 7 p.m. If you have any questions for our presenter tonight, please use the Q&A feature that's located at the bottom middle of your Zoom screen. Dr. Verlo, thank you for being with us this evening and the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to be talking about a repertoire which is engaging to so many people. And tonight, of course, when we talk about Hamilton, we're talking about one of the most successful musicals of the 21st century. And I don't think it would be hyperbolic to surmise that this will go down as one of the most successful uh, musicals uh, of this era. That is to say, um, when people reflect 20, 30, 50 years from now on music from the first few decades of the 20th century, I think 21st century, I think Hamilton will be very much uh, in the discussion. It will be in the textbooks. It's already made its way into the textbooks, if you can believe it. And I know this because uh, as, a, as a faculty member and a college uh, music professor, I'm sometimes asked to edit and make suggestions for upcoming editions of music history textbooks. And I can tell you that Hamilton has very much become a part of the literature now uh, in a scholarly uh, a sphere. So tonight's program is going to balance certain uh, elements. We're going to, of course, have a, a, a very large slice of the pie will be musical appreciation, where we'll dive into the score, as Anthony suggested, and take apart some of the leitmotifs, that is to say, the patterns of notes that uh, typify and characterize the various figures who are presented on stage. But we'll also talk about the genesis of this work, how it came to be, how it made its way uh, really from the very fertile mind of Lin-Manuel Miranda, who, who really deserves a majority of the credit in bringing this show to life. Of course, the cast members that we associate with these uh, iconic roles also deserve a significant uh, degree of credit. But, but really, this is Lin-Manuel Miranda's baby, and uh, as such, he'll uh, figure very prominently in tonight's discussion. We'll also talk about the plot of Hamilton, obviously, which will involve, I would say, a, a fairly a substantial uh, perusal of the history books. And in that sense, we'll separate fact from fiction and talk about how Hamilton presents us with a story, which is it, functional as a musical theater piece, but also largely based in fact and truth. And, and uh, where it does take poetic liberties, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's not egregious in any way. Uh, although there are some things that I think it would probably be helpful to clarify and, and uh, clear up some of the mythology that's bound up with this musical, as with any work where you're trying to uh, take a historical period and present it on stage or in a film for that matter, um, I think for many people that becomes sort of their canonic interpretation of that period of history, right? Um, uh, that's true not only of history, but it's true it, really in general, anytime a book is adapted to the stage or to film. I know a lot of students um, years ago when I was first teaching, who had never read the Lord of the Rings books, but they knew the films inside and out. And therefore for them, the film was sort of the, the canonical authority. And of course, that's, um, that's unfortunate. People should read, they should certainly read the Lord of the Rings book, books, um, and people should read Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton, which really uh, formed the backbone and the, uh, I would say much of the inspiration from which Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, drew this remarkable story of the, the so-called $10 founding father Whose, uh, whose story was, was buried to some degree. And we're going to address this issue. We're going to ask ourselves why prior to this show and certainly prior to the 2004 release of Cherno's biography of Hamilton, why this figure was, I would say somewhat nebulous in the history of, of American politics. Why was someone who was so influential, who had such an impact, such a profound shaping 
not only of our banking system, I think many people are familiar with that aspect, but also to a large degree, uh, Hamilton was involved in uh, shaping what essentially became the two-party system that still dominates American politics today. He was also involved in the very first uh, political sex scandal long before Bill Clinton and the infamous blue dress. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was involved in the Reynolds affair. And we'll talk about that next week when we get to act two. Um, the geography of how uh, our country's political institutions are shaped, for example, the Capitol being in Washington, D.C., but the banking authorities being based primarily in New York City. That's also something that is largely uh, credited to Alexander Hamilton. And yet with all of this interesting uh, information and with all of these important contributions that this uh, remarkable figure made to the history of the inchoate and nascent United States of America, uh, the musical, I think, raises an interesting question, which it finally addresses uh, in a very poignant manner in the last song, which we'll get to next week, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story. Uh, we'll, we'll start to understand why Hamilton's um, feats were, were marginalized or, or uh, swept under the rug, maybe put uh, aside and, and not really fully appreciated until long after he died in Weehawk in New Jersey, after he was shot and killed, as many of you know. Spoiler alert. Uh, if you're not familiar with the story of Hamilton, um, you'll get familiar with it this evening. So I encourage you, as Anthony said, please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A function, or perhaps you can use the chat function, and I will get to them. We'll take periodic breaks throughout uh, the evening, and I'll address any questions when I see that particular tab light up orange. A few things about uh, Hamilton. I mentioned it was based on the Cherno biography. And for those of you, since um, we are, of course, uh, lucky enough to be, uh, to be in a position where uh, we can now frequent the library, and of course, it's a little bit different than it was, but, um, but we can certainly go to the library. And I believe, Anthony, we're taking people now in 30-minute 30 uh, minute appointments they can make. Uh, I encourage people to go to the library and go ahead and, and take out that biography of, uh, of uh, Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. Again, it's uh, about mm, 16 or 17 years old now. And I think um, it, you know, there's a reason why Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, was so inspired by it. I myself uh, had a chance to read it before I discovered the musical. And uh, I was sort of blown away with so many of these, uh, these anecdotes and details and facts which are conveyed in the book which were not part of any curriculum that I enjoyed as a student, either in an AP uh, history class in high school or even in history classes um, in, uh, in college. Uh, I'm not sure how much time is spent talking specifically about Alexander Hamilton. My sense is that more time will be spent and a lot of that can be chalked up to the success and the impact of this musical. So let's talk about why it's so successful. Fantastic, and I see Anthony has go gone ahead and linked um, uh, a portal there so that uh, folks can go ahead and place a hold on taking out that book. You won't regret it. Uh, it's a big, a big book, a long read, I suppose you'd say, but a fast read and a, and a very compelling one. All right, so a few little details about the musical and then we'll jump right into the score. Hamilton really from its opening received what can only be described as critical acclaim. And this was really on full display um, in the Tony Awards where uh, it absolutely dominated in 2016. I think that was the 70th Tony Awards. And it received 16 nominations and 11 awards, of course, including uh, Best Musical. It received in the same year the Pulitzer Prize for, for Drama. Um, I think a lot of the cast members have gone on to enjoy a tremendous degree of success. David Diggs, for example, who plays the Marquis de Lafayette, as well as Thomas Jefferson in Act Two. We'll see him in both roles next week as Jefferson, this week as Lafayette. Um, he's got a big role on the show Snowpiercer, which is a sort of marquee show on the TNT network. Uh, I think one could feasibly make the claim that Davy Diggs, a lot of the success he's enjoying right now, uh, could be traced to the tremendous performance that he gave in the role of both the Marquis de Lafayette in Act One and again Thomas Jefferson in Act Two. Um, so a, a huge success, critical acclaim from the onset. Uh, record-breaking nominations and awards, including the really big and, and important awards such as Best Musical, Pulitzer Prize for Drama, uh, invitations to the White House. Um, I think many of you probably are familiar with some of this, this imagery because Hamilton was then, and of course, uh, in the last year, it's experienced a huge resurgence in popularity due to the pandemic and due to Disney. 
uh, licensing the rights to air it on the Disney Plus network. Now, you can imagine how much, how deep the Disney pockets are and how much they would have paid to host um, a musical theater on the Disney network. It's kind of an odd choice if you think about it because, well, their Broadway has its own sort of Netflix type uh, format for, um, for uh, selling subscriptions to watch productions of musicals. So the fact that Disney was uh, willing to reach deep into their coffers to shell out for the rights to, uh, to broadcast this is a testament to just how hot a ticket this was. And if you recall over the summer, those of you who have Disney Plus, which is, I would imagine is probably anyone here with young children or grandchildren, especially, uh, you'll remember they released it right around July 4th, I think on July 4th this year. So it um, has this sort of patriotic resonance that uh, is, is bound up with the show. So that's a little bit about the, um, the history of its performance. Let's talk about the language of Hamilton. Well, as many of you who are familiar with Lin-Manuel Miranda know, he's a very versatile composer who certainly has uh, a deep foundation rooting in the traditional musical theater world. In fact, uh, he had been involved in a number of musicals before Hamilton, some of which went on to, to win a number of Tonys. I think In the Heights won four Tony Awards, if I'm not mistaken. He's also had tremendous success as a composer of film music. Um, one of my daughter, the older one, who's now two years and a couple of months old, um, she loves to go up to the Echo in the kitchen and say, in her adorable two-year-old voice, Lexa, play Moana. Well, Alexa doesn't Moana. always. Un <laughs> Alexa, off. <laughs> well, now we we've all been there, right? So, um, the uh, the score of Moana, written by Lin Manuel Miranda. So, this is someone who's had tremendous success both in the Broadway world, but also in the film world now. And of course, uh, many of you know that In the Heights is being made into a feature film. I think it's due to be released next year. There are a couple of big Broadway productions that are coming out in film versions uh, in the coming year. Dear Evan Hansen is another one. All right, so what is what are some of the hallmark traits of Lin-Manuel Miranda's style? I would say, again, a firm foundation in traditional musical theater. But obviously, I would say the big one is his use of spoken word, uh, rap, but hip hop, and there is a distinction, we'll get into it this evening. And uh, also his command of, of styles, which are neither uh, rap, hip hop, nor are they uh, in the vein of traditional musical theater. Act two, for example, of Hamilton, as many of you know, starts with the song sung by Thomas Jefferson called What Did I Miss? And it's got a great amalgam of different styles. Some of it is sort of new wave hip hop, but some of it goes into this, you know, boogie woogie, uh, Baseline, which is a, a way of talking about a baseline that sort of arpeggiates dominant seventh chords. And we'll look at that next week. Um, there are numbers which kind of are hard to pin down in terms of style. The Room Where It Happened is a piece that, uh, again, has uh, characteristics that evoke jazz, characteristics that evoke hip hop, uh, and meld uh, all of these disparate elements together. So I think a lot of the success of Hamilton, due to the creativity and brilliance of the composer and lyricist, but also due to this amalgam of styles. And the hip hop especially is something that deserves further mention, specifically because it's so atypical, it's becoming more typical, but it's so unusual to find this particular language, this rhythmic language presented in a musical theater production. Of course, now after Hamilton, it's, it's less uh, unusual, it's less atypical than it was. But what it allows is really two things. Number one, it allows you as a composer to incorporate more text than you ever could in a sung through piece. Let me repeat that. When you have, when you're using rap or hip hop as your medium for conveying text, you can include far more text than you ever could if something was sung through. And that's certainly the case in Hamilton. The score of Hamilton is about 567 pages long um, in the conductor score. And that's a tremendous, tremendous um, a volume of pages. And the reason is because there's so much text in Hamilton. Now, I don't think this is something that we're bothered by and it's not even something we're cognizant of. The reason is because the way the rap flows, uh, the singers, the, the actors are able to convey and um, expound a tremendous amount of verbiage uh, without having to go through the traditional medium of singing. And singing is more complex in a way because when you sing, some notes are held for a long time, some notes are sustained, some notes are repeated, and that's typically not gonna be the case when you're rapping. So there's an awful lot that's baked into this pie here. Let's go ahead and look at the opening number. 
The opening number, of course, is called Alexander Hamilton. And there's a lot of interesting things about it. I think even if you don't read music, it will be helpful to look at the score. So let's go ahead and do that together. When we look at the score here, we may notice a few things which are unusual. Even if you don't read music, you may notice these X's on the note heads. What that suggests is that these notes are to be uh, essentially uh, declaimed without any pitch, without any particular tone. So even though these notes are on the middle line of what is essentially a treble clef, let me make this a little bit bigger, not that big, um, there is no pitch associated. And that is the telltale sign that this is to be spoken in rhythm, AKA rapped. So let's draw the distinction between rap and hip hop. Rap might be described as a declamation of text that occurs following very specific meter and with very specific uh, rhythmic articulation. So for example, a seasoned musician or anybody who reads music would be able to clap out this rhythm. Um, there's no variability to it. The way it's written, it should be performed theoretically the same way every time because it is specifically notated this way. So even though rap doesn't involve notes, it still follows the same Western system of notation of rhythm. Rhythm is really the critical thing here. When you see these uh, notes, when the X's are gone, you'll start to see the notes move around the staff a little bit. And that means that the actor in this case would be singing rather than speaking in rhythm. So what's the difference between rap and hip hop? Well, the scholarship is not exactly in agreement about this, but one thing most people agree with is that hip hop tends to have a larger degree of musical underscoring, that rap tends to have a very Spartan or sometimes a non-existent musical underscoring, whereas hip hop, you're gonna get perhaps uh, not just notes in the bass, but maybe you'll get uh, pianistic flourishes, uh, moving lines, instrumental uh, motifs and the like. I think if you uh, look, if we were to look later on at the song Satisfied, which is sung by Angelica Schuyler, um, that's a great example of hip hop. Whereas the opening number, I would say certainly more, uh, there is hip hop here, but maybe parts of it are closer to rapping. Uh, and that would be for the for example, the case in the beginning because we have almost no musical underscoring, uh, just this very, very skeletal accompaniment outlining certain harmonies but with actually no harmony and no sung notes. It's just single notes in the bass. So let's take a look at this peculiar introduction. You'll see that this um, sequence of uh, letters NC means no chord. What Miranda wants the pit to sound essentially to st strike up this piece is not a big fancy um, prelude like we might get in an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical or in a Stephen Sondheim musical. Instead here, we get exactly one measure at slow tempo, that's it. It's very unusual in that way to start the musical with just a single measure and with these repeated F sharps in the rhythm, bum, ba da da dum, bum, bum. Um, this rhythm with this, what we call a triplet, you can see the three here, for many is going to evoke a sort of the snare drum that we associate with the military ensembles and kind of marching bands. Um, I think some have also written about how it evokes cannon fire and the sort of the, um, the boom of, of war. Remember that act one is primarily bound up with the events associated, leading up to, associated with, and immediately succeeding the American Revolution. So there's a lot of excitement that's built into the plot of act one. I don't think we can say the same for act two. Act two is a much tougher sell on paper. Of course, Miranda handles it with aplomb and makes it interesting, but act one, uh, the drama invites a very creative uh, musical setting, and that's what we're going to get. One thing I will say about this is that the opening number is just about four minutes long, and we'll listen to it. And uh, immediately after this opening number, we find ourselves um, with Alexander arriving in New York, and most scholars agree probably around the age of 17. If you're wondering, uh, Hamilton was born, we think, in 1756, which is a significant year in music history. I'm sure some of you know why. Who was born in 1756? Well, if you said Mozart, you'd be correct. I know some of you are probably patting yourselves on the back as you should. Um, we don't necessarily associate Hamilton and Mozart in the same breath. And yet uh, they were almost exact contemporaries as were Joseph Haydn or Josef Haydn, the famous Austrian composer and George Washington also born uh, within a couple of months of each other in 1732. So if you're uh, coming to tonight's program, with more of a foundation and a background and an interest in the Western 
uh, classical canon, that is to say the standard canon of Western art music and um, Broadway or perhaps American history is, is uh, less familiar to you, it may be interesting for you to consider some of the figures who were living out their lives uh, side by side in parallel um, with the heroes and the villains of our story here tonight. So Hamilton arrives in New York uh, around the age of 17. And um, in the Ron Chernow biography, those of you who have read it will no doubt remember that Chernow spends uh, several chapters detailing Alexander's youth, some of which is shrouded in mystery, by the way, uh, for as prolific a writer as Hamilton was later in his life, he was not exactly uh, glib when talking about his youth, and we'll find out why that was. Uh, in fact, we get a, a glimpse into it in the very first song when he's described as a bastard, an orphan, a son of a whore, and a Scotsman. Um, well, obviously, with uh, that kind of dubious parentage, at least as it's related here by Aaron Burr in the first line, uh, one can understand why Hamilton would have been rather reticent when it came to discussing the details of his youth. Nonetheless, it must be said that one of the big differences from the book and the musical is that in the book, we've got several chapters and probably you know, dozens and dozens of pages, perhaps close to 100 pages detailing Alexander's youth from the time of his birth until his arrival in New York City, um, Miranda is not really interested in this period. He gets through the whole thing in three and a half minutes. This opening song is sort of setting the foundation and the action begins in New York City uh, early in the, um, in the 1770s, that is to say in the years leading up to the American Revolution. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this opening number. As with so many musical, musical theater productions and, and um, Broadway shows, the first number is your big chance for what we call exposition. This is your chance to introduce the characters, the basic sort of uh, rudimentary elements of the plot, the heroes, the villains, the, uh, the, the side men and women. Um, and in this case, we're going to be familiar with most of these characters, but let's go through them. We're going to meet Aaron Burr. Of course, we'll meet Alexander Hamilton. We'll hear from George Washington. We'll hear from the Marquis de Lafayette. We'll hear from uh, the important ladies in the story, including Eliza uh, Hamilton, nay Schuyler. We'll hear from her sister, Angelica. We'll hear uh, ever so briefly from a, a sort of a shady character named Mariah Reynolds. We'll learn more about her next week. And of course, most of this opening number is narrated by Aaron Burr. Now you might think that Burr is sort of the bad guy, the villain of this story. And um, certainly I think history has presented him in some ways in that vein, because most people know him as the guy who shot and killed Hamilton in Weehawken, New Jersey in 1804. But actually um, I would suggest that one of the really successful elements in this musical is Lin-Manuel Miranda's very nuanced treatment of Aaron Burr as a sort of a counterpart to Hamilton. In other words, Miranda emphasizes at points during the musical how similar these characters are, and actually some of their musical leitmotifs overlap and kind of reinforce in a musical way exactly that point. Let's listen to the first number and we'll go over some of the interesting details. So here is, um, I'm gonna go ahead and play the music, but we'll keep our eyes on the score. And this will give us a chance not only to appreciate this unconventional notation of spoken word, but also a chance to, uh, dig into the harmony a bit and obviously to follow the lyrics. Here we go is the opening number of Hamilton. <laughs> Son of a whore and a Scotsman Dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean By providence impoverished and squalor Grow up to be a hero and a scholar The ten dollar Founded father without a father Got a lot farther by working a lot harder By being a lot smarter By being a self-starter by fourteen They placed him in charge of a trading charter and every day while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away Across the waves he struggled and kept his guard up Inside he was longing for something to be a part of The brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow, or barter Then a hurricane came and devastation rained Our man saw his future drip, dripping down the drain Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain And he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain the word got around 
and said, this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. And the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait, just you wait. When he was ten, his father split, full of it, dead, ridden. Two years later, see Alex and his mother bed, ridden, half dead. Sitting in their own sick, the scent thick. And Alex got better, but his mother went quick. Moved in with a cousin, the cousin committed suicide. Left him with nothing but ruined bride. Something new inside a boy saying, Alex, you got a thing for yourself. He started retreating and reading every treatise on the shelf. But there would have been nothing left to do for someone less astute. He would have been dead and destitute without a cent or restitution. Started working, working for his late mother's landlord. Trading sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford. Scared of all. the opening number actually musically this is a very straightforward piece but there's a lot of the lyrics that's interesting this line here where uh here it is his enemies destroyed his reputation america forgot him and then we get the introduction of of these um, people who are so bound up with hamilton's life and deeds and ultimately his fate hercules mulliken the marquis de lafayette john lawrence george washington uh, Eliza, Angelica, Mariah, and of course, Burr has the final uh, say here. Notice that when Burr sings, there's that sort of whatever we're going to think of it as, whether it's the uh, the cannon shot, the gunshot, mm, -da -da -dum, uh, and then he comes in off the beat. There's this sort of rhythmic aberration that comes in at the time that Burr sings uh, this or speaks this last line. I think one of the things that comes up for us as we're listening to this is we're wondering, you know, what is it about this guy? We know that he achieved so much, right? That's laid out and that he was some kind of a child prodigy. That's also described for us, right? For example, we learn that his father marooned the family and left. His mother took sick and died. Uh, and yet he had this voracious appetite for literature. He's, as the line is, uh, scamming for every book he could get his hands on. Uh, he's clerking, he's balancing, uh, he's doing accounting and balancing books and, and handling inventories, and he's trading sugarcane and other commodities, all as a teenager. And this is all true, by the way. If you're wondering where this took place, the name of the island is Nevis, Nevis in the Caribbean. Uh, and finally, uh, he is afforded this chance to come to America. He's going to come to New York. And even though, of course, he's an English speaker, he's still an immigrant. And this is something that I think Miranda was particularly interested in. There's a line in the song Yorktown where Hamilton meets the Marquis de, de Lafayette and they're on the battle of this climactic and final uh, major engagement of the Revolutionary War where Cornwallis is going to surrender ultimately to George Washington. 
And um, there's a funny line where Hamilton says to Lafayette, and Lafayette says at the same time, immigrants, we get the job done. So there's a bit of humor there, but it, it testifies to the way the creator of the show really thought of uh, Hamilton as an immigrant. All right. So we ask ourselves, having listened to this opening number and having heard from these various characters, we know he's on the $10 bill, and we know he had this incredible life, which uh, is some of his deeds are alluded to here. They say he rewrote the game, right? Uh, and yet, I think for many people prior to seeing the show or certainly reading the Cherno biography, wondering why don't we hear more about this man? And we'll find out the answer to that question, I think, over the course of tonight's lecture, but of course, we're not gonna get to, the, to uncover all of the details until we get to next week's program. So if you haven't signed up for next week's program on the 8th of April, go ahead and sign up for Act Two of Hamilton. We're gonna skip ahead now, and I'm actually gonna skip to the seventh song in the show, if you can believe it. I'm, I'm gonna skip the introduction of where Hamilton meets Burr and where we meet uh, Eliza and Angelica and Peggy, the Schuyler sisters. I wanna get into some of the history that's, uh, that's conveyed here in the musical. And this is not a song that perhaps would be on many people's radar, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting song and it tells us a lot about Lin-Manuel Miranda's skills as a composer and the various styles he's able to command, something I alluded to earlier in the program, but it also shows how music can be such an effective part of the storytelling, even in what many might consider to be a sort of throwaway number within a musical filled with blockbusters. This next number is not a blockbuster, but I would say it's one of the more illuminating uh, pieces in act one in terms of uh, tell, using music to tell the story uh, through a combination of tone, but also through timbre and sound effects. Timbre refers to sound color, if you will, what the Germans call Klangfarbe. Um, the idea that you can use different instruments or different instrumental patches to, um, to create a, a mood or an effect. And we'll see how that's done here. It's very effective. The name of the song is Farmer Refuted. It's the sixth song in the show. And uh, let me go ahead and share the screen. You can see here that the character who is singing this one is named Samuel Seabury. Actually, he was a historical figure from Connecticut, if you can believe it. And he was um, uh, uh, one of the most prominent loyalists. That is to say, he was an American colonist who believed that America should be a sort of a vassal colony to England and that uh, Americans should be paying taxes to the English. So he was loyal to the then reigning King of England. We'll get to him momentarily. His name was, of course, George III, uh, the penultimate monarch who reigned from the house of Hanover, of Hanover. Um, Seabury was uh, a monarchist and a loyalist who believed uh, that America should, American colonists should stop rocking the boat. Of course, we know in 1773, we have the Boston Sea Par Tea Party and um, the clamor is going to grow as Americans are going to start meeting in tap rooms and bars and, and other institutions, sometimes in, uh, under somewhat, uh, somewhat secretive circumstances to plot and plan and hatch what would eventually become the American Revolution. Seabury was against them. So that's gonna put him in direct opposition to Alexander Hamilton. What I love about this one is that it starts, it's a very short number, but it leads into the next one. So it makes sense for us to start here. When it starts, it has this musical style, which for many is going to evoke what we sometimes call the Rococo period. So this time um, between, let's say, Mozart and uh, going back to Bach. So there are elements here that are going to sound Baroque. You can hear that uh, some of these trills, for example, some of these uh, independent moving lines, the, uh, the different rhythms in the different hands. Uh, which line up against a vocal line that has its own sort of rhythm. This is something that would have been very common in the Baroque period. And um, sometimes it's going to go into a more of a classical style. In other words, the music here is written by somebody who really understands Baroque music and also uh, the music of the Rococo and into the Enlightenment here and the, the end of the Enlightenment into the classical period. And I think that Miranda uses it very deliberately. He gives Samuel Seabury this music that makes him sound old like his ideas are antiquated and outdated. And his music therefore is going to look to the past. It's going to incorporate elements of the Baroque, elements of the Rococo. That's such a clever move. When Hamilton begins to debate him and Hamilton begins to refute him, the style is gonna change. We're gonna get more modern rhythms, uh, more sort of pulsing harmony that doesn't move uh, in the same way that it does in the beginning. That is to say, it's more static the way that we would have in a, in a, a more pop sort of driven style. 
And, um, and finally, Hamilton's going to start to really do unusual things with the rhythm. He miolas and ties across the bar line things that I'll point out that you would absolutely never see in a Baroque or classical piece. So this is very clever. I think the point, of course, is that Hamilton's style represents the future and, um, and Samuel Seabury's style represents the past. So this is a very clever bit of business here. Uh, let's listen to it, and then we'll take some questions after I see we have some questions, which I'd love to see. Um, by the way, uh, I actually had the pleasure of working with a descendant of Samuel Seabury, if you can believe it. He's a math professor at the college, and um, he's actually a, a darn good singer. But um, uh, he, this, uh, this figure, historically speaking, Samuel Seabury was a bishop, a sort of a man of the cloth who lived in, in Connecticut and was a prolific writer. He wrote mostly under a pseudonym during this very, uh, this very contentious time when um, the hostilities between the loyalists and the, uh, the Sons of Liberty, that is to say, the, those who were uh, going to be at the forefront fomenting and carrying out the revolution, um, there's a lot of hostility there, a lot of animosity, a lot of antipathy. So um, most of what Seabury wrote was written under an alias. All right, let's go ahead and listen to number six, Farmer Refuted. It may uh, interest you to know, by the way, when I was preparing my notes for tonight's program, I discovered that this song on YouTube is banned in the following countries, North Korea, China, Iran, and Syria. So apparently, uh, I mean, it makes sense to me that in North Korea and China, you are not allowed to refute farmers. Of course, I think um, some of us might find that humorous and I suppose it is unless you happen to live in China, in which case, of course, it is um, probably for most of us, I would think we would describe it as outrageous or preposterous. But there you have it. Farmer Refuted is banned in North Korea and China and a couple of other countries. Here's the song. that intro, the quality of the violin, the moving bass line, it's very clever when you really get down to brass tacks. Um, it's not just a knowledge of music theory, but also I would say Alex Lacamoire is a figure we haven't talked about. He's, um, deserve, he deserves a lot of the credit here, I think, as well, because he is responsible for a lot of the instrumentation, the orchestration, which instruments are going to be playing the notes. So this intro sort of just radiates a sense of 18th century music. And in that sense, it's perfect for framing the notes that Samuel Seabury is going to sing. <laughs> Okay, this one's going to segue directly into the next song, but um, I, I think one can't help but smile at this. There's this element of what I sometimes refer to as the urban playground. 
uh, where, which is very prominent when Hal Alexander is challenging and refuting and sort of laying the smack down, I guess we would say, using the modern parlance when he is listening to Samuel Seabury talk. And I love this. In the music, it's written in the hesitation and the fact that Seabury is sort of backing off. He's afraid to engage. He just hits his first note and then it sort of dies off as Hamilton uh, comes with totally different rhythms. Um, it's very, very clever. Hamilton even says, don't modulate the key. This is a very insider comment here that Hamilton says, I'm not sure how many people would, would recognize what this means uh, if they weren't watching with a score and, and listening to a lecture as we are right now. Um, if you look here, the key actually changes. You see there are no, none of these arcane esoteric symbols where I'm mousing over, and then it changes at the end of this system. So Hamilton actually sort of um, in some ways lifts the curtain a little bit and says, don't modulate the key. That's what we call it when we change keys in music. It's called a modulation. So all of this leads up to the moment where the chorus says, message from the king. The king has just sent a message. I love when Hamilton says, uh, is he in Jersey? Of course, the implication being, why should we pay taxes to someone who doesn't live here? All right, let's get to some questions. All right, uh, Sandra asks a good question. What enticed Miranda to uh, a Hamilton saga? And I think the answer here is, uh, Sandra, like so many people, he was just uh, inspired by, by reading a book. That's what it came down to. Um, the uh, question here, anonymous attendee, I thought the line immigrants, we get the job done, dig at Trump's policies. No, no, this is long before Trump uh, takes office. People have said the same thing about the song, Why We Build the Wall, which is in um, a, a wonderful musical that uh, everyone should also get to know, Hades Town. And people think that, you know, Hades and his wall is all supposed to be an, a an allegory for Trump, but it was written way before that. Uh, Hades Town, I think the concept album came out in 09. Um, Andrew says, am I correct that Miranda does not formally read or write music? Uh, he does read music. I'm not sure how well he does, to be honest. Uh, a lot of composers and singer-songwriter types don't. Uh, I'm not sure what his, uh, his pedigree is in terms of his education. But um, uh, the question is, uh, could you talk a bit about how people like this, if it is in fact the case here, how uh, someone would create music this way? Good question, Andrew. The answer is um, oftentimes they will sing it or they'll go to the piano and I've had this happen. I don't think this would be the case with someone like Miranda, but, but uh, oftentimes singer songwriters will say, well, I know I like the way it sounds. I don't know what these chords are called. And this is one of the reasons that I encourage all my students to take music theory at the college. And I have students even now who write music and they'll write it using programs that are not traditional notation programs. They're sort of, you know, you plug in chords and you can plug in rhythms and you don't know how to, you don't have to know how to write uh, drum parts and you don't have to know how to write uh, very nuanced uh, esoteric rhythms. Um, but a guy like Alex Lackamore, what he's going to do is he's going to sit with the composer and write out exactly, have him sing it, have him play it, play it back. Is this what you meant? Great. This is a D minor chord. This is an F minor seven chord. This is going to modulate to D flat. But uh, no, I, I don't think it's uh, correct that Miranda's um, lacking as a, as a composer in, in the sense that he can't read or write. Some people used to say that about Pavarotti, that he couldn't write, read music. And these are apocryphal stories. I think it, there's an element of sensationalism to it to believe that such a genius could compose without actually having any clue what he was really doing on a, on a very technical level. But I don't think that's the case here. Good question. All right, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Ethan Allen Brown studied law at, in Hamilton's office. Okay, very cool. Yes, Hamilton's going to open up a law office after the war in New York. We'll actually hear about that tonight. Wonderful. All right. So a message from the king. What could the king possibly say? Well, he's going to say, you'll be back. In some ways, this is a song where the king um, is going to be taunting the colonists, taunting the, uh, the revolutionaries, the sons of liberty, and saying, you know what? You all talk about how you think you want independence, but really you can't live without me. My, his majesty's government, and all of the benefits we confer upon you, you will never live without it. You'll be skinning each other like savages once you don't have the sophisticated uh, British overlords helping you. That's sort of what this song is, is conveying. Actually, it's worth a, a short digression to talk a little bit about King George III. This is his first appearance in the musical, but certainly not his last. He's here really for comic relief. That's his role in the musical. And, and I can say a few things about him that might, uh, might tickle some of you. George III is actually a very tragic case because um, 
the last decades of his life were very miserable, I think, for him specifically, but especially for his family. Uh, George III lived all the way until 1820, but he stopped being king in 1810 when essentially a regency was set up because his brain had deteriorated to such a point that he was no longer deemed fit to rule. Actually, uh, the deterioration of his mind began long before that. There are many theories about, about um, various possibly genetic uh, disorders that he may have had. Some people argue about whether he was had bipolar syndrome or, or schizophrenia. Um, one thing is for sure, almost nobody would disagree that George III suffered from severe mental illness. And I think everyone on this call can agree that when the king of, of a country, and of course the king of England didn't have absolute power as he did in the pre-Magna Carta days, but still for a powerful figure such as the king to be severely mentally ill, um, that's a bad thing. George III therefore is sometimes known to posterity as the mad king. And some of you will perhaps be familiar with the literature surrounding George III. When I was a student, I gave a recital where I sang a postmodern collection of songs called Eight Songs for a Mad King, based on texts that were either written by or written about George III. He was prone to what's called excessive loquacity, which is a, a, an unusual condition where somebody can just talk and talk and talk and talk uninterrupted. Uh, if you let them talk, they will just continue with a stream of verbiage that ceases without end. The most uh, egregious and infamous example of this, which um, simultaneously created great consternation in the kingdom, but also, I think, uh, fascination, was a particular Christmas Eve where the king spoke for over a day straight. So he spoke all, from Christmas Eve through Christmas and into the next day. I think it was closer to two days, actually. It's a, a very well-documented episode at the end of the king's life. Uh, but this bit of, uh, of trivia that he was prone to excessive loquacity might interest some of you. Uh, for example, there was a famous um, meeting in the 1780s where a foreign dignitary, I think it was a Danish uh, ambassador type figure, came to court and um, was presented to the king for an audience. And they were to discuss trade and things along uh, sort, of, sort of state policy, commerce and the like. And the king spoke for four hours just uh, Nonstop nonsense, by the way, stuff that didn't always make sense. There was another time where the king met uh, another foreign dignitary and produced inexplicably from his robes um, a cabbage and said to the man, I grant thee a cabbage. There are other stories that the king had all of the mirrors in the palace draped with, um, with black towels and, and um, drapes and the like so that he wouldn't see his reflection because he was convinced that if he saw himself in the mirror, his eyes, if you can believe it, he was convinced his eyes would turn to, and I'm quoting him here, black currant jelly. So um, for, a, uh, for a, a monarch, a head of state to be in this uh, very unfortunate position, obviously is gonna be uh, um, something that is, can be lampooned in the musical, but actually in real life, it's very sad. Um, the fact that George III uh, suffered so, and so, profoundly and was uh, such a, a miserable wretch, especially in the last decades of his life. Um, it's it's it very sad, although I should say in the musical, uh, we don't get sad from George III, he's pure comic relief. The best part about this song, the thing to listen for, I would suggest is the way Miranda shapes the words, uh, or musically how he frames the words that are of the utmost uh, sadistic violence. Remember that the British you know, their, their uh, sense of, of justice, their sense of, um, of not just justice, but also discipline was an excessively uh, harsh and draconian one. Um, anyone who's ever seen the movie, The Patriot, not that I'm endorsing that particular film, but the battle scenes are, are uh, sort of accurate that the British would just sort of line up with their muskets and, and fire. Uh, and then the other turn would, the other side would kneel and they would fire very sort of strange time in terms of uh, the combat protocols. Anyway, George III had no compunction uh, when it came to slaughtering his loyal subjects if they disobeyed him. And that's something that's kind of emphasized in the music. What you'll notice is that when the king sings his most violent words, his most sinister threats, he often does so with the sweetest and most syrupy, poignant sounding chords underneath. Major add nine chords, major seventh chords, uh, uh, subdominant uh, dominant uh, superimpositions, which create what we call slash chord. These are very interesting and charming harmonies, which don't sound the least bit threatening. And yet, if you listen to what he's saying, uh, he's being exceptionally violent. So let's go ahead and listen to 
you'll be back from act one. Here is the score. And you can see here the score starts um, with the king saying, uh, you say the price of my love is not a price you're willing to pay. I think this is a clear reference to some of the events leading up to the revolution, specifically the Boston Tea Party, which we alluded to earlier, and then the harsh and draconian measures which were taken against the colony of Massachusetts after it, uh, specifically with respect to their trading charter. So um, let's go ahead and listen to this. You say the price of my love is not a price that you're willing to pay. You cry in your tea, which you hurl in the sea when you see me go by. Why so sad? Remember we made an arrangement when you went away. Now you're making me mad. Remember despite our estrangement, I'm your man. You'll be back, soon you'll see you remember you belong to me You'll be back, time will tell you remember that I served you well Oceans rise, empires fall We have seen each other through it all And when push comes to shove I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love. Did you notice that very, uh, as I described it earlier, this very poignant harmony right at the moment when the king says, I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my life. And how is he going to do that? Of course, by slaughtering them. Um, we get now to the chorus, the refrain, and this is a, a bit of musical comedy. Now, you might ask, how can music sound funny? I think what Miranda is doing here is very clever for a number of reasons. One, he gives the king this sort of very hoppy melody that's all over the place. If you look at it and you listen to it momentarily, it's filled with odd intervals and big jumps, both up and down, uh, patterns of notes that are fairly atypical. And it's all sung on these nonsense syllables, da, 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 ya, da, da, da. And what it does is it gives the king this very childish quality. It makes him seem like, like a, a mischievous, a petulant, child who happens to be in command of the most powerful army in the world. So um, there's, there's a bit of humor that's built into the text here, but also into this pattern, which if you notice, the keyboard is playing on a harpsichord patch here, which is very clever. So we get these clipped and staccato harpsichord notes um, against the syncopated left hand or bass notes. And all the while, the king is singing nonsense syllables on this melody that has no rhyme or reason to it. So some of the lunacy of the king is perhaps baked into this line. I think maybe that's deliberate on Miranda's part. He wants the king to sound like he's just a little bit um, off his rocker. Maybe uh, the lights are on, but nobody quite home. So sometimes he's lucid and sometimes he's not. And this is that episode where he's not really lucid.
da 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 So we get this song and it's in a major key and the chorus is in major and it's it has a very bright and chipper sound to it. And yet what's it about? It's about the king threatening the most brutal and, and car, uh, carnage upon those who defy him. Uh, interesting little note about this song before we move on. Remember that uh, Jonathan Groff, um, who originated the role of King George III, uh, he sings this. This is his big number in the show. He has a couple of other uh, reprises of sorts where he comes back with the same music on different topics. Um, but he, the, uh, the story is that when he was cast in Frozen as Kristoff, um, they didn't give him a song. He has a very short song in Frozen, uh, the first movie. This is in 2013, that film came out. And he sings a very, very short throwaway number called Reindeers Are Better Than People. It's like 40 seconds long. And then when Hamilton came out, um, the, uh, the forces that the powers that be who were involved in Frozen basically looked at each other and said, why didn't we give this guy a bigger song in Frozen? Listen to this voice. Uh, and then, of course, when Frozen 2 came out, Kristoff gets the great, probably one of the, the, the best songs in the show, which is Lost in the Woods. All right. Um, Elizabeth says, King George's songs always remind me of a 60s pop love song. Yep, the, the rhythm is straight out of uh, that, that era. Given the theme of unrequited love here, do you think it was intentional? It's possible. That's really, um, that's a really layered <laughs> and a uh, deeper interpretation. This is what musicologists do, Elizabeth. I think uh, it's, it's not unlikely that he wanted to conjure up the, the um, sound of an era maybe where people were, were um, singing about unrequited love. It's a bit of a stretch, but that's the kind of thing where we probably have to ask the composer. It's a, maybe, it, I think there's, it's a great question because there's, there's merit to it. Um, you can make the case, but I would say the style is, is so broad in general that I don't know that we could specifically tie it exclusively to a 60s pop love song, but it does have that quality of a love song, right? That it's the text here is, is uh, you know, about uh, what he says, you know, don't change the subject. You're my favorite subject, which is a great pun on the idea of loyal subject, royal subject. Um, good question. All right, as you can see in the score, we're only on page 82 of a 567 page um, uh, score. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna go to the end of act one. So we're skipping a lot. Uh, we're skipping Alexander's courtship of Eliza Schuyler, who then became Eliza Hamilton, his relationship with Angelica. We simply don't have time to go through exhaustively. I will just say that the show does take poetic liberties with this relationship specifically because um, it presents his relationship with Angelica as being one that is flirtatious and even amorous. The implication in the show being, as it's suggested and hinted at throughout the show, is that had Eliza not uh, laid claim on Alexander, uh, Angelica, who was the sort of the more vivacious and extroverted of the two sisters, would have claimed her for himself. And Alexander was equally drawn to both of them. Well, it's true that Alexander was very close with Angelica, and it's true that he maintained a correspondence with her after she moved to London. And it's true that uh, they were confidants and, and um, I would say probably better acquainted with each other than most brothers are with their sister-in-law. Uh, most, most husbands, I should say, are with their wives' sisters. But um, there was no uh, overt amorous nature to this relationship. In fact, uh, actually, if you, you read the biography, you'll learn that Angelica was already married at the time that she met Alexander. So this is something that was added to the musical. And in fact, Miranda was asked to address it. And he said, well, yeah, I knew about it, obviously, but I thought that it added an interesting wrinkle to the plot. And of course it does, it drives a lot of the middle of act one. And act one is, is long. Um, you know, this, this is a musical that probably, you know, I would say substantially longer than the average musical, clocking in at about two and a half hours, which, you know, an average musical might be closer to 80 or 90 minutes. So, um, Having the Angelica, Al Eliza, and Alexander love triangle, I think, really propels the drama 
in the middle of Act One. We're going to go to the end of Act One. I want to share a video with you from the 70th Tony Awards. The reason I want to share a video is because to truly appreciate Hamilton, uh, those of you who have attended my lectures before know that I, I place a paramount marquee value on looking at the score. Even if you don't read music, I think the score is still a tremendous resource. However, to appreciate what's going on in this musical, we really want to be able to, to appreciate uh, some of the visual elements that are associated with the pageantry of uh, musical theater, but specifically with a period musical that involves elaborate choreography and uh, costuming, which is, uh, I think, some of the um, some of the most spellbinding uh, in, in the entire canon of musical theater. And it, it's encouraging on the one hand because you look at this and you say, well, you know, period musicals like Hamilton and like Les Mis are enormously popular and they also stimulate an interest in history and people will go out and read history books and they'll take classes and seminars and, and perhaps even college courses and they'll read more and take books out from their library. But uh, the only negative with period musicals is that they're so difficult to do on the community level and costuming is a big part of that. It's one of the reasons Les Mis is so hard to do. I mean, you can do it with uh, postmodern staging, but to do it with real costuming, um, I'm imagining, I'm hoping, that sometime in the next, uh, well, I don't know, however many years, Hamilton, the rights will become available and we'll be able to do it at the college. But I'm already imagining um, the, the dean telling me that we don't have a budget to, <laughs> to costume it. All right, anyway. So what we wanna do is take a look at some of this remarkable choreography. And the choreography in Hamilton, um, you know, incorporates so many different aspects. Of, it's not like, uh, oh, some of those classic musicals from the 70s choreographed by Bob Fosse, where it's all shoulders and, and a lot of jazz hands. Here, we're going to get a lot of modern, we're going to get a lot of hip hop, and a lot of traditional um, dance styles as well. Some of the most interesting choreographed uh, moments in the show come from the battle scenes, and specifically the Battle of Yorktown, which, as we know, was the climactic battle of the Revolutionary War. This is the battle where George Corn Cornwallis, uh, the, the uh, presiding general over the British armies, surrenders, submits his, his uh, surrender. They wave the white flag to um, signal their defeat. The song is called Yorktown, open parentheses, the world turned upside down, close parentheses. And those are the words that are sung throughout the, the number. Now you might say, why is it called the world turned upside down? The answer is this was a particular British drinking song from the period. And it was customary in war in the 18th century that when you vanquished your foe, when they conceded defeat, uh, one of the curious idiosyncrasies of that period was that the defeated army had to sing uh, a famous melody associated with the victorious army. But here in this case, George Washington uh, being uh, more forgiving and be just being grateful we think that the war was over and uh, not wanting to humiliate his foes allowed them to sing one of their own songs and so the British troops chose the world turned upside down and so rather than having to sing an American song which would have been humiliating uh, sort of a, a way for the victors to gloat Washington gave them the opportunity to sing their own song and that's why the inspiration for the name of this um, of this one all right let's go over to um, YouTube here, and we're going to watch this video. This is um, from the Tony Awards, and this is really, if you don't have Disney Plus and you're looking for not just this musical, but any musical, really the only way to watch full clips in high definition, uh, you know, that is not a, what we call a bootleg, is to look for ones from, you know, morning talk shows or um, certainly an award show like the Tonys. Here we go. The Battle of Yorktown. 1781. Monsieur Hamilton! Monsieur Lafayette! In command where you belong! Are you saying no sweat? Uh, We're finally on the field. We've had quite a run. Immigrants. We get the job done. So what happens if we win? I go back to France. I bring freedom to my people if I'm given the chance. We'll be with you when you do. Go lead your men. I'll see you on the other side. Till we meet again. Let's go! Down. To the world turns upside down. I imagine that so much you feel 
more like a memory. This is where it gets me. On my feet, the enemy ahead of me. If this is the end of me, at least I have a friend with me. Repping with my hands, a command of my men with me. Then I remember my Allah's is expecting me. Not only that, my Allah's is expecting. So we gotta go, gotta get the job done. Gotta start a new nation, gotta meet my son. Take the bullets out your gun, the bullets out your gun. We move undercover and we move as one. Through the night, we have one shot to live another day. We cannot let a straight gunshot give us away. We will fight up close. Seize the moment of stay in it. It's either that or meet the business end of a bayonet. The code word is Rochambeau, Diggy. Rochambeau! You have your orders now, go man, go. Show the American experiment begins. With my friends all scattered to the winds. Lawrence is in South Carolina, redefining bravery. We'll, we'll never be free until we end slavery. When we finally drive the British away, Lafayette is there waiting in Chesapeake Bay. How did we know that this plan would work? We had a spy on the inside, that's right. I I I Tell a spying on the British government. I take the measurements of information and then I smuggle it. To my brother's revolutionary covenant. I'm running with the sons of liberty and I am loving it. See, that's what happens when you're up against the ruffians. We in the shit. Somebody's got to shovel it. Hercules Mulligan. I need no introduction. When you knock me down, I get the f back up again. After a week of fighting, a young man in a red coat stands on a parapet. We lower our guns as he frantically waves their white handkerchief. And just like that, it's over. We tend to our wounded, we count our dead. Black and white soldiers wonder alike if this really means freedom. Not yet. We negotiate the terms of surrender. I see George Washington smile. We escort the men out of your town. They stagger home single file. Tens of thousands of people flood the streets. There are screams and church bells ringing. And as our fallen foes retreat, I hear the drinking song they're singing. If you're wondering who did the choreography here, it's Andy Blankenbuehler is the choreographer. He's made very famous uh, in the Broadway scene. He also choreographed in the Heights. Uh, so his re relationship with Lin-Manuel Miranda had already been established at this point. All right, uh, we are, we got time for one more and I wanna talk, this will be our setup for next week so we can have a sense of what to expect as we go into part two or act two of the musical. Well, now that we've gotten to the end of the war, and America is essentially free from the yoke of, uh, of, of the, uh, the British and the draconian measures enforced by George III and his underlings. It's no longer a vassal state, but now a free, autonomous, and independent nation. What next? Well, George Washington actually has a very illuminating line here towards the end of Act I, where he says something along the lines of, winning is easy, governing is harder. Uh, and that's exactly what's going to be addressed in the last number of Act One. It's a, a spellbinding tour de force. And of course, those of you who know it know that it's called nonstop. It comes all the way at the end and it introduces us to the, the New York scene in the aftermath of the war. Now, Hamilton, we know, of course, is going to be rooted in uh, New York. And he's just come back from his uh, this campaign in Yorktown. Remember that Hamilton is very, very close to George Washington. That part of the musical is actually rooted. In fact, Hamilton was had the official title of aide de camp. Essentially, he was Washington's right hand man, uh, something of a secretary, but more than that, also a confidant and a strategist. So uh, we're now, you know, Burr and Hamilton have been fighting on the same side, right? Because 
Uh, presumably, they were both involved uh, in various battles, although we've gotten the sense throughout Act One that while Hamilton is more gung-ho in his, his zealous approach to, to battle and the, the quest for American independence, we get the impression that that's not the case with Burr, that Burr is perhaps more evasive, maybe more conniving, certainly doesn't wear his heart on his sleeve the way that Hamilton does. And of course, um, he's going to be more, he's going to deflect, he's going to evade. Uh, remember in the scene when Hamilton is, he, is uh, refuting Samuel Seabury, remember that Burr chimes in at one point and says something like, leave him alone. In other words, stop uh, stop arguing with him and to which Hamilton responds with something along the lines of I'd rather be di divisive than evasive. So this is the uh, the conflagration between these two characters that is destined to take the over the stage in act two. Here we're going to start to see the seeds planted and all of those combustible elements associated with these two characters who are kind of like antipodes in a way. Remember Hamilton, brash, uh, zealous, um, is completely, um, completely dedicated to his principles and his ideals with ironclad conviction and unabashed when it comes to sharing his thoughts and his ideas, even if they're unpopular. Burr, more of what we, I suppose, might call a politician, right? Burr is more evasive. He deflects. He doesn't like to give straightforward yes or no answers, but rather he likes to massage the answers so that he might please everyone. Well, this is going to come to a head in the end of Act One, and this is, again, it's called nonstop. It's one of the longest numbers, perhaps the longest number in the show, I think, actually. And it brings us from Virginia, from Yorktown, all the way back to New York. And now we meet uh, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Bird. They're no longer soldiers. Now they are citizens. And they're, they've come back to civilian life. They're both going to practice law. Burr, as we'll see, uh, is going to say, is, he starts the narration. He says, after the war, I went back to New York. And then Hamilton repeats the same words after the war, I went back to New York. And I think, you know, Miranda does this throughout the musical. He wants to draw attention to the parallels between these two characters. So pay attention in this number for where Hamilton and Burr either repeat uh, one another or whether where the points where they completely diverge in their attitudes, opinions, and, um, and policies, I guess we'd say. Eventually, the song is going to catch, catch us up with all the other characters, the main characters from Act One, specifically Eliza, Angelica, and of course, George Washington. And basically what happens is uh, we learn the following. We learn that Hamilton becomes a brilliant lawyer. We learn that Burr also becomes a lawyer who is sometimes working in tandem with and sometimes at odds with Hamilton. We learn that Hamilton becomes very invested in government and he starts writing the Federalist Papers, which some of you perhaps had to read in your history classes. I had to take... Uh, I had to read them in a political science class I took as a freshman. Um, Hamilton is going to write the majority of the Federalist Papers. We're going to learn that Hamilton is going to be approached by George Washington, who basically says to him, I need you. Uh, we're going to learn that Eliza, we've already learned that she's expecting, right? She's pregnant. And then therefore, Alexander has to juggle this life of being a brilliant lawyer, but also a political activist, and now being asked to join the cabinet of the first president, George Washington. Um, all of this, he's got a balance with being a family man, and he's going to do very poorly at that, as we'll see next week when we look at Act Two. Or I suppose I should say, some people would say he did very poorly. I think one could make the argument that Hamilton was a very dedicated father and husband in some ways, but um, as with, um, I think, many workaholics, found a hard time striking that balance in life between his home and family life. We're going to meet with Burr, who's <clears throat> going to flat out refuse to be a part of uh, the writing of the Federalist Papers. Uh, we're gonna learn that Angelica has left and gone over to England with her husband. And we're gonna hear from Eliza, who of course is going to be begging Alexander, just give me a fraction of your time that you would give to Washington and to the government and to the country. Um, I, would be, I would be completely satisfied and, and um, content with that. So a lot to get to, let's take a look at the score and we'll listen to it. This one is mostly very upbeat. Again, this is the very end of Act One and it's going to set up Act Two, which we'll get to next week. After the war, I went back to New York. After the war, I went back to New York. I finished up my studies and I practiced law. I practiced law, Burr worked next door. Even though we started at the very same time, Alexander Hamilton began to climb. How to account for his rise to the top? 
Man, the man is non-stop. Gentlemen of the jury, I'm curious, bear with me. Are you aware that we're making history? This is the first murder trial of our brand new nation. The liberty behind the liberation. I intend to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt with my assistant counsel. Go, counsel Hamilton, sit down. A client, Lemmy Weeks, is innocent. Call your first witness. That's all you had to say. Okay. One more thing. Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Assume that attitude may be your doom. Uh, why do you write like you're running out of time? Write day and night like you're running out of time. Every day you fight like you're running out of time. Keep on fighting in the meantime. Non-stop. Corruption's such an old song that we can sing along in harmony. And nowhere is it stronger than in Albany. This colony's economy's increasingly stalling. And honestly, that's why public service Just seems to be calling me. I practice the law, practically perfected it. I've seen injustice in the world and I've corrected it. Now for a strong central democracy. If not, then I'll be Socrates throwing verbal rocks at these mediocrities. Oh. Hamilton at the Constitutional Convention. I was chosen for the Constitutional Convention. There is a New York Junior Delegate. Now what I'm gonna say may sound indelicate. Oh. He goes and proposes his own form of government. What? His own plan for a new form of government. What? Talks for six hours. The convention is listless. Right, young man. Yo, who the F is this? Why do you always say what you believe? Why do you always say what you believe? Every proclamation guarantees free ammunition for your enemies. Oh. Why do you write like it's going out of style? Right day and night like it's going out of style. Every day you fight like it's going out of style. Do what you do. All right, we're going to pause here. Now you notice the door knocks and Hamilton is now going to approach Burr. And he's going to ask him, and notice how the music becomes far more lyrical here. There's this sort of uh, tender melody which is introduced in the piano. It suggests that Hamilton is coming over to Burr and yes, he is supplicating. He's asking him for a favor. Um, and notice how Burr's answer can might be described as cagey and evasive, as we said. Alexander? Aaron Burr, sir. Well, it's the middle of the night. Can we confer, sir? Is this a legal matter? Yes, and it's important to me. What do you need? Burr, you're a better lawyer than me. Okay. I know I talk too much. I'm abrasive. You're incredible in court. You're succinct, persuasive. My client needs a strong defense. You're the solution. Who's your client? The new U.S. Constitution. No. Hear me out. No way. A series of essays anonymously published defending the document of the public. No one will read it. I disagree. And if it fails. Burr, that's why we need it. The Constitution's a mess. So it needs amendments. It's full of contradictions. So is independence. We have to start somewhere. No. No way. You're making a mistake. Good night. Hey, what are you waiting for? What do you stall for? What? We won the war. What was it all for? Do you support this constitution? Of course. Then defend it. And what if you're backing the wrong horse? Burr, we studied and we fought and we killed for the notion of a nation we now get to build. For once in your life, take a stand with pride. I don't understand how you stand to the side. I'll keep all my hands close to my chest. Accompanied by someone who always pays I have found a wealthy husband Who will keep me in comfort for all my days He is not a lot of fun But there's no one who can match you But turn up phrase My Alexander Don't forget to ride Look at where you are Look at where you started The fact that you're alive is a miracle To stay alive, that would be enough if your wife could share a fraction of your time If I could grant you peace of mind Would that be enough? Alexander joins forces with James Madison and John Jay to write a series of essays defending the new United States Constitution entitled The Federalist Papers. The plan was to write a total of 25 essays, the work divided evenly among the three men. In the end, they wrote 85 essays in the span of six months. John Jay got sick after writing five. James Madison wrote 29. Hamilton wrote the other 51. How do you write like you're running out of time? Write day and night like you're running out of time. Every day you fight like you're running out of time. Like you're running out of time. Are you running out of time? How do you write like you're running out of time? 
like tomorrow won't arrive How do you write like you needed to survive? How do you write every second you're alive? Every second you're alive? Every second you're alive? They're asking me to leave I'm doing the best I can To get the people that I need I'm asking you to be my right hand, Treasury man. Or state. I know it's a lot to treasury ask or state. to leave behind the world you know. Sir, do you want me to run the Treasury or State Department? Treasury. Let's go. Alexander. I have to leave. Alexander. Look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. Helpless. They are asking me to leave. Look around. Thus ends Act One. Now, one thing that we had absolutely no way to do tonight, but some of you may have recognized as we go through this, is Act One ends with a sort of a synthesis of every major leitmotif that we've heard in, in the entire uh, first hour plus of music. In other words, all of the different melodic cells that are associated with the various characters, Angelica has her own music, Eliza has her own music, Alexander has several leitmotifs, um, Washington has his own music. Uh, they're all sort of echoing notes and patterns that we've heard earlier in the show. And that's a very powerful uh, tool for the composer to deploy here. So not only is it a lyrical tour, of course, but musically, uh, this number certainly is a contender for one of the most memorable songs in the show for the way it sets up act two and the way it, it uh, makes us feel this incredible sense of familiarity and sympathy with the various characters uh, we're hearing in, in, this, in this number as they're singing about essentially. Um, you know, the, the whirlwind of events that have led them to this post-war world where the things should be settled, right? And yet uh, things are as chaotic as ever. And that's gonna take us into act two next week. We'll see how Alexander does uh, deal with this whirlwind of chaos as he decides to accept Washington's uh, uh, request. Notice it didn't take him long and he becomes secretary of the treasury. That's gonna put him in direct opposition with Thomas Jefferson, who's gonna be the first secretary of state. There's a lot to talk about there, many combustible elements. And of course, we'll hear more from some of the characters we didn't hear from tonight, especially Eliza, who closes out act two um, with um, an elaborate solo in the last song, which is one of the most tender, lyrical and poignant moments, not just in this musical, but in any musical. But we'll have to wait until next week to get there. So I see we've got a couple of pro, uh, questions here, mostly just, uh, great, thank you. Sandra references uh, Joseph and the Technicolor. Yes, um, I'm with you on that one. All right, I wanna thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Kathy, that's so uh, thoughtful of you. Um, thank you everybody for attending this program and I hope to see you next week uh, for part two. Anthony, what a blast, huh? Thank you, Gil, that was wonderful. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending, spending the evening with us. Um, enjoy your upcoming holiday um, weekend. Stay safe, and we will see you again uh, this time next week. <laughs>